software patterns are here, and they're really hard to kill. And they keep coming. So it is time to do something. Our next two speakers will give you a brief overview of what happened in the past, how it worked, and what we could do about that in the future. Please give a very warm applause to Iga and Benjamin. Okay, then. I cannot see the first slide. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to do anything or it's going to be just screened behind my back. I don't know, so I'm still waiting. Um, hello, my name is Iga. I'm a lawyer, so someone with totally different interests probably than you do have. And what I can say by now, all the law uh, related conference I've ever been to are much more boring than this one. Okay, so we have. <laughs> Um, I've been into this problem for many years. Um, I've defended my master thesis on patenting software, and I thought that by the end I've done it. It was like 2009. We have almost 2016. I was sure that it probably had to be settled, but it's not. Uh, and a guy who works at the Polish patent office, he told me that maybe I would like to go once again into the subject because there are many new decisions. The problem has not been solved. And right now what I would like to do uh, is to motivate you to call you for action because the situation needs to be changed and you're going to see why and in which direction right now it's going to. All right, what do we want to talk about with Benjamin here? Um, we're still a little bit in a Christmas mood, so this is a scene from Christmas Carol. As far as you know, the Scrooge is being visited by the ghost of the past, ghost of the present, and ghost of the future. I'll tell you a little bit about the past and the present, and probably something that Benjamin has to say combines the present situation with the future. Right, how far we've come since the directive proposal? You see the directive proposal, this is this um, directive that was uh, rejected by the European Parliament on, well, now that's the question, on what was it? Because in Europe we tend to pretend that it was on something like computer implemented inventions. I will tell you something about situation in the US and they purely call it like the software patents, but in Europe it was called like computer implemented inventions. And how far have, have you come from that to where? Well, then we were in the middle of nowhere because actually we didn't go anywhere. Some people say that, okay, so was it finished by 2005? So they rejected the directive, so it means that they just said no to software patents. We don't have any software patents in Europe and that's totally not true. And why, why are we here we're in a black hole because nothing has has happened, good happened, between um, these uh, time gap. Um, Benjamin will tell you something more about um, uh, unitary patent, and this is something uh, what, what would be really uh, dangerous right now in that case. Uh, when we'll be in 2016, it's up to you. We would like to suggest you to some actions. I've been to a very brilliant speech of the guy that named Thomas from Save the Internet. He described the ways that they undertook to fight for the free internet. Um, he said that uh, some of the things he said, it's too late for that. So but don't, let's don't be worried because he finished like with keep fighting. So this is what we're going to do. All right. So how does European look like relating to software patents? And I'm going to just give you a brief um, speech from the legal point of view. First of all, we have a European Patent Convention that is the source of a mess. You must remember that does not give you a patent that is effective in all European countries. This is only a bundle of patents. This is very important because each national court, each national uh, officials uh, may refuse granting this patent on the basis of European uh, Patent Convention regarding, for example, the differences when it comes to patenting software. And Benjamin will tell you about this regulation introducing implementing enhanced cooperation, so I will just skip it right now. What's the problem with that? Uh, first of all, in the uh, very basic version of European Patent Convention, we didn't have uh, anything about fields of technology for which the patent is supposed to be granted. It was something that was so-called obvious, but it was that much obvious that nobody actually knew what it meant. Um, we lawyers uh, tend to uh, keep to the idea that the patents are only for the technology, for something that may be um, verified by the experiment, for something that it's connected in a tangible word, not for uh, mathematical or um, abstract idea. So that was introduced in 2000, so that is pretty late because this is something, as I'm telling you, it's a very basic rule in patent law. 
Uh, then we have exceptions. Uh, from the patent protection, and as you can see here in uh, letter A, we have programs from computers, and this is what European Patent Convention says, but then there is a problem, because it says that they are not protected only as long as there are programs as such. So it gives the false assumption that there are some computer programs that are patentable and some computer programs that are not. And when you read the patent claims that people who want to convince you that what they actually have is not a uh, software patent, well, this description is something like that. They know that they do not sell meat, but actually what is it? Nobody knows. You can only imagine how it looks like. This is the impression that I get when I read the patent claims. And at first I thought this is my fault because I'm a lawyer, I don't understand them, but I consulted them and no one understands what they try and express. Apart from the fact that it's obvious they do not have the invention. They have a software something and it tastes like chicken. Okay then. Um, in 2000, before the, the directive was rejected, of course that was after several years of implementing the action plan, and the European Commission, first of all, tell, told people, told the citizens that they have to do something because this is what is required by the economy in the US and the economy in Japan. What they forgot to tell was that the attitude in US towards software patents has been changing and that uh, the, the conclusions that they gave wasn't true anymore and they are not true right now. So the European Commission said that since by the end of 2000, the IPO already granted to, to, uh, 20 hundred um, 20,000, thank you, software patents, it means that we need to change the law. Normally, I would treat it as a confession that they did something against the law because the law said you may not grant the patent, but they say, okay, that's a great argument. Let's introduce the software patent protection. Um, and this is something that they failed to do. They also wanted to cross out this exception for computer programs from the European Patent Convention as the result of the fact that they already granted that many patents for software. Those two actions actually failed. Um, how actually European Patent Office deals with that kind of applications? Well, they tried to convince you once again that this, what is claimed, this is not purely computer program, this is something in between. So at first they uh, went with the, attitude, the, the approach that checked the technical contribution approach. So if uh, the solution gives up something to the technical aspects, regardless whether it lies in software itself on in any different characteristic of invention, that's still cool. So we may grant uh, the patent uh, on the solution that it's purely software. Um, if we cross that out, that still be uh, nothing actually new to the technical state. Now, it, it evolved, but actually um, uh, the result is the same. Now, the EPO uh, goes with further technical effect. What does it mean? No one knows. It means that software may produce a further technical effect. Why is it further? Because it produced no technical effect while using the invention. Okay, this is, these are some examples you may go through. What is technical in the eyes of EPOs? Uh, and for example, in Polish legislation, we don't have, as in many legislation, this exclusion um, that uh, patent uh, cannot be granted only for software as such. So our uh, officials, our courts just say, okay, we don't have to apply that because we don't have it in our national law. European Patent Convention is something that only allows you to get faster the protection in the countries that you indicate. So this is only procedural stuff. The thing, if you get the patent or not, depends on the local authorities. What do we have here next? The question, the answer to it is supposed to be obvious. Can the president of EPO instruct national judges? Can he or she, depending on their circumstances? Well, we're supposed to say that no, but there is a curious case of Polish cases, but I'm truly convinced that it's not only what's happening in Poland. I'm telling about Poland cases because this is something that I know from my practice, from my legal practice and um, let's say my um, scientific activity. What's happening in Poland and maybe happening right now in your country? Okay, if you want to get a patent, you go to the Patent Office of Republic of Poland. If you're not pleased with the decision, especially when you are Siemens, Google, or any huge company that the software patents was rejected, then you can appeal to District Administrative Court and then the last chance, Supreme Administrative Court. And what is going on right now in Poland? At the, at the first instance, like Patent Office says, 
This is what she's given us. It's nothing more but a pure software, even though you're trying to convince us that it's not. We don't grant you the patent. We don't care that you've already have a European patent for that because we have our domestic legal provisions and that's, we don't have that kind of exclusion as, as such. We don't know what it is as such. As such, I'm telling you, you're not getting a patent. So then um, it's getting higher instance, district administrative court, and usually those judges um, are totally in line with patent office, they say, yes, we are truly convinced there were uh, opinion of the experts, this is not the invention, we don't get a patent for that. And then magic happens. It, go it goes to Supreme Administrative Court, and for the last few years, this is what's happening. First of all, this is the one of the judgments, but I could name many of them. As you can see, it's pretty fresh. So um, there are some kind of instructions. Um, they are not called instructions. They are called justifications for the judgment. And the justifications are that Polish Patent Office is obliged to follow EPO's understanding of invention of its technical character. Why? Because this is international agreement and it is superior to our national law. The problem is that that would be true if that would be the same, um, the same matter that is regulated. But European Patent Convention does not tell you about the content of the patent, about what you can do. This is just a procedural stuff. The thing's gonna be changed after unitary patent will come into force. The Benjamin will talk about that. Right now, the national authorities have still the power to say no. And what's curious, actually, this is applied also to purely domestic cases, to purely domestic cases when we even don't have the EPO patent evolved, but because we are the part of the European Patent Organization, we're supposed to follow that. Then, uh, they also say, by they, I mean the, the judges of the Supreme Administrative Court, that EPO's reasoning is coherent with TRIPS. Um, I would like you to go to this website I recommend you because um, uh, there is a resolution that started by Mark, Ma uh, Max Planck Institute um, that explains that still the countries are independent of how they actually interpret the technical character. They don't have to follow any um, imposes of international law, uh, they are free to do that. So this is another lie. And the final one, um, that Polish Patent Office is obliged to follow EPO's decisions and proceed according to guidelines for examination in the EPO. So something that was designed for the internal use suddenly is right up as if that was any kind of source of law because the Polish judges says that we are obliged to do that because this is for the common good, this is international thing. Let's make it clear that we do it the same way as the EPO does, but no one judges if the EPO's okay or not with that. Okay, how does it look like in US? And I'm talking about that because as I told you at the beginning, um, the European Commission says that they had to introduce some changes, some amendments to European Patent Convention by ruling out the computer programs exception um, because this is what US actually imposes on us. So this is on what um, the innovative technology is built in US. Um, this looks a little bit different in US. First of all, they don't have any particular provision that would say that software patents are allowed. Um, but there are, of, co of course, much the, the big interests that say that that could be read in this provision where, uh, because it says that you can get a patent over a process. But by that time when this provision was made, no one ever thought about computer programs. So this process has got nothing to do with the process that machine does according to the algorithm. Uh, what they also have, they don't have the legal exclusions, but they have the case law. So these are, these are um, judicial exceptions to the four categories, like this process, processes, manufacturing, compositional matters. If there is a law of nature, natural phenomena, or abstract idea, then you don't get a patent. And now the task of the judge is to look at the invention, to look at the computer program, to look at the business method. Um, right now, business methods are usually introduced by the use of software patents. So sometimes they are combined with each other. So someone has a way uh, in which the business is supposed to be conducted and introduces it through the software. So it's like a double claim here. Look at these statistics, they are pretty fresh because they are from the end of the October. And as you can see here, um, the 
total invalid under this provision that says what may be the subject of intervention is pretty high. And if you go to another statistics, like 85 to 90 percent, depending on the court, um, it's all about software or business methods. So it means that the U.S. is no longer pro-software patents. This is false assumption telling that we have to change our European role to give um, equal chances to what's going on in America. The thing that's going on in America are really surprising. There is a brilliant guy, he's called um, John Oliver. I wanted to post his video, but I'm afraid that he would stall the show, so I wouldn't. Um, just time into, uh, into YouTube, not right now. Um, the last week show with John Oliver, and he, he tells there's something that I cannot tell whether it's true. This is as if sometimes I read um, political um, description of what Polish government had done. I have no idea if it's true or is it not true. Did someone enter in the middle of the night of the NATO series? Or I have no idea if it's true or not. What, what actually he said? He said that um, American companies deduced that there is um, in Texas, um, in one of the city, there is a court that is very, very um, um, uh, well, I don't know how even to call it that. He understands the pain of the big companies and the jurors also do understand them. So if you want to sue someone, go there. They don't have that many inhabitants, but if you check how many actually lawsuits were brought them, this is highly technological, inventive city. And the information that was passed, and I cannot tell you whether it was true or not, um, there was a, a, a journalist inside of the, in, in front of the courthouse, and she said, look, this is ice ring that was sponsored by Samsung so we could skate during, um, when, when there is no snow and there is no ice in front of the courtroom that was sponsored by Samsung. Is it true? Is it not? I have no idea. But if it's true, um, it's, easy, it's a very simple message. Go pro Samsung so you'd have to... Uh, so, so, so that would be easy for you to get the ice ring before the courthouse. Okay, so this is the American attitude right now. Um, usually you can uh, go through that in that kind of um, stages. I don't want to go through that cases because probably know them. Um, the thing is that the attitude has evolved, it has changed from, uh, from the time that uh, when the court said that it's enough if you give a new software to totally not new machine, you get as a result of the invention. Okay, but that was many years ago. Right now, after the Bilski case, after the Alice case, um, it's obvious that American courts really don't want to get a patent for abstract ideas, and they are, they are not that easy to be uh, deceived. Okay, so this is um, the description of the cases. You may go for the, um, uh, for the presentation. I don't want to waste time for that right now. Um, what I wanted also to tell you, that it, that would be very important in European case. What can we do about that? Um, the great thing was done in the U.S. by the year 2012. There was a great conference. Why I call it great conference? First of all, a lot of people representing different, uh, different societies came there, different stakeholders, not only lawyers who can tell whatever they want because well, who cares if it doesn't have our application? This is something that I'm um, that can exist without any uh, without any application. I, I may say whatever I want, but they also gathered uh, the program is they also gathered the representative of a huge um, a huge technological thing, and they say that actually they go for the patents only to defend themselves. They're not needed, but if they see that that many people are getting patent. Um, they also want to do that. So these were um, the solutions that are suggested. I will skip to this getting rid of all software patents. I'm not saying that it's fair, but at least we know what we're standing on. Right now the situation is not good because one may be, great, be granted a patent and the other may not. This is something that is the worst for, for the competition and I think um, uh, that this is something that we're supposed to oppose. All right, so are we helpless? I would say that not. And here we have some voice from the society that tells what's supposed to be done. I highly uh, re re recommend you to go to the Bundestag motion addressed to the German government. They say they require from their government to um, not to allow to give software patents, just to focus on copyright protection. And the very brand new decision, uh, resolution of December 17th 
on patents of uh, biotechnological inventions as broccoli and tomatoes. And if you go through this resolution of EP, as you can see here, it's exactly what we need in case of software patents because they want um, to explain how all the provisions are supposed to be understood and what Benjamin will talk about in a minute, um, how it's going to look like after the unitary patent come into force because if it comes into force, then the national judges wouldn't have any authority to decide whether the patent is supposed to be granted or not. Um, the Polish... Uh, the Polish uh, approach towards this unitary patent has changed because from the very enthusiastic and the beginning, uh, we went for the enhanced cooperation, but at the very last moment, Polish government just didn't sign the final papers. But if he wishes to do that, there's open way. So we need to do something just to tell people that it is important and it wasn't solved by the year of 2005, that the directive was rejected. It doesn't mean that we don't have software patents uh, in in Europe. All right, so probably Benjamin would like to take the floor right now because I heard some ringing and probably it was addressed to me. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Do you want this one? This one? That's okay. Uh, uh, the first slide, normally there is a picture. Very important picture, and it's not on the slides, so um, we have to do something about it. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> ah. <laughs> Otherwise, I try to take my computer. Do you have internet there? Or? Yeah. All right, so we're so, going to do um, I'm going to start presenting myself. Um, so I'm Benjamin Henrion, I'm from uh, Brussels in Belgium. Sorry. And uh, basically I st uh, started the university uh, in 1998. And uh, that was the beginning of the internet, the fast internet uh, at the university. And uh, I went on some websites, uh, translated into many languages. Uh, that was asking a petition to uh, Commissioner Karl van Miert, uh, who was a, a commissioner for the internal market, for a study on software patents. And that was made by a person named uh, Hartmut Pilch. Hartmut Pilch uh, is uh, um, the founder of the FFI. And uh, uh, that's how I became involved into software patents. So, um, I then organized uh, some conference with my Linux user group in my university, inviting uh, people who worked on the version 1.0 of the first attempt to, to change the law regarding software patents in Europe. And that first change was a, uh, trying to remove the word computer programs from the list of exceptions uh, in the European Patent, Patent Convention. So the patent community tried to do that uh, via a diplomatic conference, like uh, for any, co any uh, uh, international treaty, you have to call for a diplomatic conference where all the countries uh, like Monaco or France or Germany have each one vote. And uh, they, so uh, Hartmut Pilch and another Frenchman, uh, Jean-Paul Smet managed to convince uh, the delegation of France and other countries to oppose this uh, removal of the word computer programs from the, the, from the, um, from the list of exceptions. And uh, so the diplomatic conference happened. Uh, they managed to get through uh, in 2000 a revision of the uh, EPC to insert uh, words from TRIPS that says that patents should be granted for any field of technology. And uh, when you read the convention and you read this uh, new uh, thing, you could say that there, is a, there might be a clash between the exceptions and the, um, and the um, I mean, between those two articles. So at the end, the result of the EPC 2000 was that there was a huge frustration among the patent community to not being able to remove uh, that uh, exception uh, to match the, the, the practice of the European Patent Office. The European Patent Office has been granted software patents since 
uh, mostly the first big decision, uh, administrative one, was in 1986, uh, where they started to grant software patents. Um, so the, the next step was to call uh, this community wanted to, 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 uh, to find another way. And so they, called, they asked the European Commission to launch a process for having a European directive. And this process lasted from 2000 to 2005. And that was the, the period of uh, software patents version 2.0. Maybe I can try to get my slides. Um, I, I will skip the, the, the picture, um, even though it was important. So actually, the picture I wanted to show you, which someone ruined my presentation. I, I prefer PDF uh, for a reason. Um, so the, the picture I wanted to show you is a, is, is, is a, um, we, were, we were in the European Parliament in July 2005, uh, and there was another lobby from the big uh, companies that rented a, a yacht in the European Parliament. So the European Parliament is two buildings with some river crossing in, in, the, in, the, in the middle, and they wrote a yacht with a big banner, a vote for uh, CII, a vote for uh, software patents, basically. And uh, on my side, I was also helping to organize uh, people with yellow t-shirts in front of the European Parliament so that uh, we had like uh, uh, protesters in, the, in front of the, of the Parliament. And uh, I was so upset by this vote that I, I managed to, to call a friend of of mine who was in the uh, in the in, in, in the, f the the front of the European Parliament, and uh, I saw that there were some place to rent some kayaks, and I asked him, "Can you rent some kayaks and and kick me that boat?" So they took uh, they took some banners uh, saying uh, "Software Patent Skill Innovation," and they went with uh, two uh, three kayaks uh, fighting against that yacht, and uh, so at that moment. At that moment, the decision of the European Parliament was already, uh, already kind of uh, done. No, not the vote was not the vote was not done, but the, the crucial moment was um, the uh, the other side, the big corporation, asked for uh, dropping the the vote on this issue, and they asked for uh, a new uh, European Patent Court. So I was I was very surprised because, uh, to my opinion, it's it's uh, if they cannot change the law, they cannot change the law. The problem is, in this case, is that you have at least f uh, seven or eight different interpretation of the what the law means, and so it depends on the judge. Uh, it depends on the judge what 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 is going to be the interpretation. So actually, now uh, uh, in 2005. The, the plan for what is now becoming the European patent was already uh, the, the third version of software patents in Europe, which is not, having, not reopening the software patent debate, but having uh, set, setting up uh, a court system, a pan-European court system, which is outside of uh, the structure of nations, outside of uh, uh, even Europe, uh, the European Union itself. So, and uh, at that time, I don't know if I can uh, go find my slides back. Uh, so, the, uh, the, that was a press release that was uh, published by ECTA, which was regrouping the, the Microsoft, IBM, and others. And uh, you, you had to have a, a look on what they, they published. It was clear that their plan uh, at the time was already to prepare uh, a call for European Patent Court. So they said, uh, we're going to look at how to improve the patent system for everybody in another, in another way. Um, so uh, this quote is on a website called epla.ffi.org. And that's uh, basically uh, when we were talking about uh, this directive in Brussels, there was a representative of the EPO, uh, David Sand, who is now working as a patent attorney in London, filing software patents, or at least helping them. Uh, and he said, yeah, we don't, need, uh, we don't need this debate about software patents. We just need uh, a unified patent litigation system. 
because if we have this uh, unified patent litigation system, uh, we don't have any difference between uh, uh, UK or Germany if they interpret the convention differently. No, we have, we have a central court that's going to decide, and it creates a single point of failure, a single point of reference, where we know the interpretation uh, for sure. OK. Um, so uh, this is a screenshot from the, so uh, after um, the directive, there was uh, six months just after the directive, there was a commission relaunching a consultation about patents, how to improve patents. Uh, and uh, there was like a huge, uh, uh, um, huge submissions from small software companies that participating to the directive. And uh, the outcome of the, this consultation was the relaunch of a, a, a treaty uh, that was negotiated back before, which is what's called EPLA, the European Patent Litigation Agreement. And the European Patent Litigation Agreement was a clone of the EPC, but for courts. So uh, in Europe, you have, for the grant part, you have the EPO, which is granting those national patents in a, in a central way. But those national patents, they still have to be litigated by country country by country. You don't have a court system which is doing this, the, 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 the same role as the EPO, but for enforcing the patents. Um, so this uh, EPLA treaty was uh, coming from the EPO circles. And uh, so they, they discussed that uh, option to sign uh, having an EPLA in, back in 2007. And that was mostly rejected because uh, France and other countries said, yeah, but how does that fit with the European Union system? How does that play with the European Court of Justice? And so um, they, make, uh, they made, uh, France said, we, we have constitutional problems. We cannot sign this treaty. And uh, so they made another version and another version. Uh, it became the Euro UPLS, the, European, uh, the Union Patent Litigation System. Um, and uh, so they, they kind of made several versions through the years up to a point where uh, they had some kind of thing that could be called compatible with the role of the European Court of Justice. And uh, so what happened is that they, uh, they signed uh, something back in 2012, which is called the Unitary Patent and the Unitary Patent Court, which is formed out of three regulations uh, that has to be ratified by e each national parliament in each country. And the status, it, it is now that eight countries have ratified uh, by heart uh, uh, France, uh, Denmark, Portugal, uh, Malta, and some others. But the main two countries uh, that has to ratify in order for the treaty to enter into force, the main two countries are UK and uh, Germany. And those two countries have not ratified yet. One of the issue is the Brexit in the UK. Because if the, uh, so the question is whether they put the ratification before the Brexit or after the Brexit. And the second uh, uh, question is if the UK uh, goes for Brexit, what happens with the treaty? Because it says, uh, that's a, 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 a separate discussion. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to say is that uh, this uh, screen capture comes from the website of the European Parliament where it's a QA about uh, the 2012 agreement that was uh, signed in December. And uh, they said that they have a FAQ. And they said, uh, yeah, can, you, can, you, can software be patented under the new rules? And they said, no. Uh, and when I read that, I was like, OK, uh, they fought. I mean, it's propaganda, and they fell into the, to some trap. Um, so this is a tweet from a conference, a recent conference in London, where the representative of the EPO said, uh, said basically, yeah, the European Patent Court will provide strong harmonization for, uh, for ICT or software, and we play a dominant role uh, in the patent world. So that's the fact that I wanted to show contrast between how the legislation is sold, how, it's, uh, how they sell it to people, and what it means in reality after it has been adopted, they say, yeah, it's, it's about software patents. Um, so a small initiative that I made uh, back in March. Uh, in Belgium, we have a very interesting country with three official languages, mostly uh, uh, German, French, and 
a Dutch, and um, there's a special case where uh, a patent granted to a German co uh, company got granted in Belgium uh, without any translation to f uh, French and Dutch, and it was declared valid for the whole country, <laughs> even if most people in Belgium don't speak German. Um, so there is uh, already in the law in Belgium very strange things about uh, validity of uh, uh, translations. And the main goal of the unitary patent on the grant side is to remove uh, uh, um, mandatory translations for patents. So actually the big cost of uh, when you apply for a patent and you want the 27 member states of the EU, it's very costly because you have to translate in a legalese words uh, in each language. And they made the DPO made a partnership with Google so that uh, they can have automatic translation of, of patents. And that's actually what is in the regulation, uh, the, the council regulation, is that they have a 10-year period where they, uh, they, uh, they start with a, a system where uh, companies uh, have legally binding uh, versions in English and non-legally binding automated translation with Google Translate uh, with a non-legal effect. So they created a, a new law that says uh, well, automated translation without any legal validity is OK. Um, so uh, if you Google for the, the, the challenge, I raised uh, three important points. The first was uh, languages. As a, as a French native speaker, of course, I felt a bit uh, offensed by the fact that I don't have a legally binding version and I have to build a business on that. Um, so the, the, the Sp Spain also uh, made uh, an appeal to the, to the U European Court of Justice against the unitary patent on five or six points. And one of the points was the language uh, translations. I mean, uh, I do have a, a girlfriend who is Spanish and uh, I've been to the family in Spain, and they mostly only speak Spanish. Um, the, the court says, yeah, it's perfectly fine if you discriminate people and have this uh, automated uh, language translation system for the unitary patent. And uh, basically, they, they said they give the green light to uh, the unitary patent in, uh, for, for that issue. Another interesting point, a legal point, was the, you have those three uh, regulations, and then you have the rules of procedure of the court. Um, and I was in a conference uh, back in the end of 2014, where a representative of Microsoft was lobbying for uh, some rules on uh, the thresholds for injunction. So thresholds for injunction is um, whether you can freeze some assets, whether you can, uh, the judge can decide to stop the, 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 for example, the Xbox being sold in Germany and things like that. And uh, he, he was very surprised because he was lobbying people who, who were not politicians. He was lobbying people who, who were an administrative committee, but who had the power to write some rules. And uh, afterwards, uh, I, I engaged with a lawyer who was uh, very critical on that point because he said, yeah, normally rules of procedure for a court are decided and accepted by parliaments. So uh, in, in the United Patent, you have a committee drafting 130 pages of legal rules, and uh, that's mostly lawyers and judges that even write the, 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 uh, the rules for their own future court. And there's something there of which I was not very comfortable, and I found a uh, very
because uh, the, um, the, the EPO cannot be attacked in court for what they do. Um, and so the, the rule, uh, it's called in English the rule of law. Uh, in French, it's l'état de droit. And uh, the rule of law uh, says there, is, there should be an instit institutional system where the, the public authority uh, is uh, regulated by law. So unfortunately, this appeal was rejected because there's a differentiation in Belgium between uh, appeals uh, for it against normal law and against international treaties. And we filed it just the last day of the six months, but actually it was six weeks, so uh, our appeal wa was rejected. But I'm looking at uh, other countries like Portugal, where it's uh, way easier. Uh, there's no constraint on how you can file a, uh, something uh, against the Constitutional Court. And I'm also looking at uh, forming a group of lawyers and experts on how to bring those three points uh, to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. But for that, I might need to uh, raise a bit of money in the future, in the near future, uh, via some crowdfunding or something. Um, okay. So uh, what is going on right now with DPO is there, there is some crisis going on because uh, I don't know if you read some news, or at least if you are interested, there is a very interesting blog called Tech Rights, uh, where uh, many people in the, in the staff of DPO are very upset about new staff rules uh, pushed by the president of DPO. And uh, there's an ongoing strikes every two weeks. Uh, uh, the, the work atmosphere is not very good. The, the pe people who committed suicides and uh, so the atmosphere there is, is, not, is not great. Uh, and there's, uh, many people there are afraid. They, 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 they have key loggers on their computers. Uh, they have, the management is trying to spy everything they do to avoid leaks. Uh, so I wanted to mention a very small point here, which is another uh, angle of attack for, against the Unitary patent is that they are, uh, it's Article 142 of the European Patent Convention. And they mentioned here that they kind of solve the problem of enhanced cooperation with the Council regulation. So uh, if you are a specialist in international law, normally you, you are able to, to have an agreement in international law, not uh, using EU law to fix international law. So that's for Spain if they want to go forward. Um, so the, the future, the near future, is that I'm preparing something on the legal side, but I would be very, uh, I would be very interested if some other people join to wake up the coalition uh, in countries such as Germany, uh, UK, or even other countries where the EPC is not yet ratified, because there's evidence that uh, this court is is not made for people, it's made for the patent system, and it's going to contribute to the, to the patent inflation, to the, um, to the patent warming, the global patent warming of more patents, cheaper patents, uh, patents for more fields, patents for software, patents for biotech, uh, patents for medical, uh, uh, medical treatments, uh, medical, it's called, there's an, medical techniques. Um, and uh, th there is a need for uh, getting to your parliament and say, look, uh, we have some problems with this unitary patent uh, monster. Um, so I wanted to give the floor to Andre. So Andre is the secretary of FFI, and he made an initiative which is, uh, he called for uh, a petition at the EU level to integrate the EPO inside the European Union system. So I wanted to give him the floor for uh, for one or two minutes. Okay. Do you have the microphone? Is I don't know. What? No. Do you have You can do it without the slides. No, no, no the file. Yeah, I know, but. Uh, okay, so. Uh, Maybe you have to speak in the microphone what there. Do you switch on the microphone? Yeah. Does it work? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, many of the problems that are very technical and maybe very abstract for people not working in the field of patents um, 
boil down to governance issues, governance issues within the patent system. And um, out of these governance issues, whether you're pro-patent or anti-patent or reject patents in certain fields or are uh, satisfied with the patent system or not, um, there should be some window for reform for the ability of the lawmaker to somehow influence the process. And during the last 20 years, there was this tendency within the patent system to shield itself from the political process, from the democratic process. And it's going further and further. And one of the main points of this unitary patent court is that it's like judiciary without a legislative correction branch. So the European Parliament cannot change what uh, the judiciary then decides. And that's somehow against basic principles of governance. So uh, regardless how we see the issue of software patents, we want to somehow bring this institution, the European Patent Office, back into the EU system. Because the EU system is very well developed and the EPO is, say, it's a treaty organization from the 19, in the 1960s, 1970s style. So there's no parliamentary oversight and so on. So I just filed a petition to the European Parliament and it, I got confirmation like two months ago that it was accepted. So my, the substance of my petition in short is, first of all, I want the European Parliament to have the ability to send questions to the European Patent Office or its administrative council that's governing the EPO. So, how do we get Parliament oversight of the EPO? Right now, if they write to the Commission or to the Council, they say, but this is not an EU institution, we can't do it. So the way to do it, very simply, is the European Parliament can independently with the EPO um, try to get an inter-institutional agreement. So my petition is about asking the European Parliament to start a negotiation process with the European Patent Office to start a yeah, Do you have it to, online? To get on screen. Can you put it online? I don't know how to do it. Put the screen there and there. Okay. Ah, okay. Doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, my so according to me, the European Patent Office is an international European institution which does not fall under EU law, which is right. He proposes that the EU contacts the EPO in order to conclude an inter-institutional agreement that would enable the members of the European Parliament, your select, uh, elected representatives in the European Parliament, to address parliamentary questions to the EPO and improve the parliamentary supervision of the EPO. The petitioner, that's me, also asked the European Commission to harmonize national substantive patent law so that patent law becomes part of the acquis Communautaire. What does it mean? Well, uh, the European Software Patents Directive was rejected, and there's, hard, there's no European patent law. There's just national patent law, and then we have the European Patent Office that centralized in the 70s the granting of patents, and then became like the de facto institution deciding what's uh, patentable or not, but that's not really the point behind this European Patent Convention. So my idea is there should be a directive on European level that at least harmonizes patent law, uh, like the status quo, not specifically addressing software patents, just the law, so it's on the European level and you harmonize all the national laws because then actually the European Union, the European Commission gets in charge because it's part of the so-called acquis communautaire that's, again, a very technical term, but it basically means everything that's regulated on the EU level. And, uh, yeah, because the, the major differences that still exist, Poland has a completely different law than Germany, and this would then enable, actually, the, on the European side, that we are able to balance the different areas of patent law with, say, competition law, with standardization, because it's all on the same level. Um, yeah, um, and the EPO, which is just the patent office, it cannot deal, oh, sorry, uh, it cannot deal with all these differences, it's a de facto harmonizer. So, um, and yeah, I guess it's good for the balance of powers, and um, it would strengthen also so the international negotiating posi position of the European Union in matters of patent law with respect to third parties, like on the international, uh, global level with WIPO, the SPLT, TRIPS, uh, and in Trade Fora. So uh, my petition, the name of my petition, 
oops, my petition has a number, and that's 2370-2014. So when you just remember this, a 2370 slash 2014, that's, that's the name of my petition. Then you can, you are able to support my petition by writing to the petition committee of the European Parliament, say, wow, this is a good idea, and I also have these experiences with the European Parliament, and uh, let's do something about it. And I guess it would be very helpful to get some public support for my petition. Um, and when they see in the European Parliament that there's a lot of attention to this proposal for an institutional reform, which just leads to sane governance, not resolve the, the, the issue of, of software patents, just moves a bit to sane governance, um, yeah, then I would say um, there's a process now where you can inject your stuff. Without a process, we can talk, sit in a room, uh, but there's, there's nothing right now that can be done. And maybe then we will get hearings, we'll get some experts discussions uh, when there's a huge public interest in my petition. So just remember the number 2370 slash 2014. And uh, I would uh, very much welcome if you write some letters in support to the petition committee of the European Parliament under this uh, uh, subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iga and Benjamin. If you have questions, please line up at the microphones. We have around seven minutes for a few questions, if we have them. Are there questions from the internet? Yes, I have a question. Um, it is, um, is there a differentiation um, between the patentability of computer software and mere mathematical formulas? Maybe you can answer that one. Like, wh wh where's for, for example, there's um, yeah. compression algorithms for, mm -hmm. for music. For example, MP3 was patented. Well, um, I've heard about few solutions of that kind, but the question is that they um, actually give patents for the solutions that you once known about, and this is like first come, first served. So probably in that case, you're supposed to look for uh, that, that sort of patent. So. Here Not particular go. compression, yeah. but probably in, in that part. Um, so actually, in the European Patent Convention, you have uh, another item for the exclusion of uh, algorithms. Um, As an abstract matter, so. Yeah, purely an abstract matter. But when it comes to, uh, let's say, if you, if you implement in the form of computer program, you fall Let's say the, the, the pure mathematical is not patentable, but if you implement it in the form of software, then it becomes patentable because the EPO says it's patentable despite the exclusion of computer programs. Uh, so yeah, for me, it's abstract matter. Mm. So, and all those um, exclusions in the EPC are all about abstract matters like mathematics. Uh, like idea, concepts, like way of conduct. So. Uh, there's mathematics, presentation of information like GUI, uh, computer programs uh, and uh, business methods, methods for doing business. So all those uh, things have one thing in common, is that they are abstract. And that makes the reference to the current discussion in Alice in the US, is that they all say it's an abstract idea, but yeah, but it's abstract. So uh, that's a criteria that the, 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 the Supreme Court kind of used to say those matters should be excluded. So they have something in common. The fact that the EPO makes an exception for software uh, and even other fields get attacked because if you look at the EPO uh, uh, jurisprudence on, on GUIs, on graphical user interface, they also grant patents for, uh, let's say, dragging a mouse uh, uh, and an icon somewhere on the screen. So uh, even other, other exceptions are getting attacked. Question from the front right microphone. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for your presentation. It's a very complex uh, issue, and I support the idea. But I would like to, if I may, clarify mm. the, the, the answer to the question. Thank you. Uh, well, algorithms as such are not patentable. But in case of uh, MP3, um, if you have an algorithm, uh, well, software that solves certain technical problem in a technical way, with the issue you also mm -hmm. tried, then it's patentable. That's wh that was the case with MP3 and many other software. But, well, I have a uh, couple of issues. Well, uh, 
to your anecdotal uh, mm -hmm. case from Texas, it's true. Really? I can't recall the name of the city, but... Uh, Marshall I'm or something like that? Marshall and Tyler. Marshall. Yeah, right. yeah, could be, because mm -hmm. um, the company I work for, we have American lawyers who also told us about the okay. situation, Samsung and Apple, because they meet there very often. So, you know, they have mm. to entertain themselves in a certain manner. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would like to point out a very, um, I think, important issue in a unitary substantive law, because you focused your presentation uh, on procedural matters in case of granting mm -hmm. software. But there is in the UPC agreement in Article 27, letter key, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, I, I conduct research on patent exceptions, and I also focus on this, and there is a provision on interoperability, mm -hmm. which as such concern, uh, well, source code, and software as such, but lawmakers for some reason included this in clearly patent, uh, patent law. And I think this is also a very troublemaking uh, issue. And uh, instead of clarifying the situation, it spells only troubles. And um, well, if you have any comments. Because well, I, have, I can continue. <laughs> interoperability is about protocols and file formats. Uh, yeah, but this, okay, yeah, but this is software, like pure software. Mm -hmm. And now you have this in also in patent law, in material patent law. Mm -hmm. So I think this is an issue because but actually you can interpret this. It would imply if you, if you make an exception. Uh, we had the same debate during the, the software patent directive. We, we had Red Hat and, uh, and uh, IBM pushing for interoperability exception because if they, s they saw, like, if the directive is adopted, it's a fallback mm -hmm. position to have to diminish the impact of software patents. And uh, the fact that it's in the UPC is a bit worrying because it means that they imply that uh, software is patentable, yeah, but exactly. they have an interoperability exception. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. And do you have, uh, besides the, the petition, do you have any other ideas to, to, f to, you know, to make further steps in your action? Because I would... The, the further steps is, is uh, um, either we try, we, I, I try or other people try to recreate some 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 coalitions of industry in, mm -hmm. in Germany in the UK to block the ratification, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that should be the first step for me. Uh, the legal steps are just they can be done in the future in the, after that. But when you have uh, when you are in a war, you have some mm -hmm. uh, some uh, bullets to, yeah. to to shoot, and it's mm -hmm. better to shoot the, the first bullet. And if this, the first bullet fails, you still have the second one. Well, if I may add something, here. the problem is that these amendments got to be really huge. It's not like one provision is going to change. This is something like starting work from the bottom. And yeah, I don't want to say that it's too late for that because it wasn't the case that people didn't do anything mm -hmm. because it was, you know, some kind of um, uh, activities during the years. But I think that that's the main problem that this is not like the one provision you take out and you may come up with a conclusion, you may come up mm. with a solution, because mm -hmm. this is the easiest way of dialogue. Yeah? We want that kind of change. We want to change actually almost everything, and yeah, that's the problem. You want to problem. change also mindset, and, actually. Yeah, so yeah, that's why it's so problematic. Not, uh, it's not uh, simple to, to address a given action, so it's need to be complex. Okay, I will give. Uh, we have another question from the front left microphone. So uh, I have a question with regard to the 20,000 patents you mentioned before. Mm. Uh, how do we attack those? Uh, because they are still persistent and they may still uh, also yeah, prevent companies from for coming into business. Um, mm. I see here a, another challenge on maybe on a case-by-case -case base uh, just to say, okay, all of those patents we have to tackle somehow and to get rid of it. Well, some of these patents that were mentioned, these uh, were um, the statistic by the end of 2000, because that was the time when the European Commission entered into plan their action plan. So hopefully, maybe some of them are just expired by now. Um, what the, what the, um, the um, uh, experience show is that uh, you may attack that kind of patent, but usually, depending on the court, they would just say that, okay, this is technical. That was what you actually also mentioned about this technical effect, technical function of software. There are many people who doubt that because if something is purely non-technical, it cannot have any kind of technical as aspects. That was the main problem when they started to say that patent law, it's not about protection of technical solutions to technical problems, but um, also using non-technical ways to resolve some kind of problem that could be described as technical. 
Um, so nowadays the statistics in Europe are not that good. In US, it's better as you saw because there were almost like, uh, as I know the statistics, like 85% up to 90, that was the invalidation on the basis that that was abstract method. Um, business method or software, but I also mentioned that nowadays <laughs> it's combined. It's usually you need a software to introduce this innovative um, business matter. So the more money you have, the better you come up with. And the main problem is, which you are probably aware of, that sometimes they just sue for fun, even though they know you're going to lose. The costs are so huge. And when they're, when they're um, first introduced in this uh, um, unitary patent system, they say, we have to do that because it's going to be cheaper right now to get the patent protection. But for whom cheaper? That's the first question. And then they didn't take into consideration all the litigation. And of course, I'm, I'm from a country where the innovative um, in terms of patent application is very, very low. And as you see for the whole European Union map, these countries who are the most developed will, uh, will um, you know, just gain the more. So. Actually, when you look at Europe in terms of number of software patents per country, all the American big companies, they go uh, France, UK, Germany, and uh, other countries like yeah. Poland, mostly they are not concerned about those patents. But the problem with unitary patent is that instead of filing for those three countries, they're going to have the 27 countries for free. So all the countries, uh, let's say uh, Hungary or, or even Belgium, won't, suddenly will get, a, will get a, an extension of, of more patents uh, uh, because they're going to be cheaper, because they, they, they're going to cover the whole Un European Union uh, uh, at once. Um, so this problem of, of patent deflation that is very visible in the United States because there's a lot of litigation around them is going to come with the unitar unitary patent because that's the objective of the, of the lawmaker is to get uh, cheaper patents and uh, enforceable, much more easier and so on. So the, the, the troll phenomena that you see in the US, they are all, all the ingredients are, are here with the unitary patent to have the same effect. Okay, and the last remark, they are very hard to detect these software patents because since officially you don't get a patent over software methods, you don't have a given category uh, among which you may make a research for. So probably there are lots of software patents that are not called software patents and you cannot even detect them. So the numbers are also maybe not reflecting the, 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 the reality. Hmm. I'm afraid we're all out of time. Thank you okay, very much, Iga and Benjamin. Thank if you. you have any further questions, after the talk.